the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. This is a very in-depth study of a person who's trying to be a good person, yeah, yeah. but she doesn't have self-awareness, and she thinks that uh, she's been mistreated by the gods. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Psyche? She doesn't realize her love for Psyche is very possessive. She doesn't realize her love for Barty is possessive. She doesn't realize the reason that Redival became kind of a bad girl is because she felt left out. Right. So I think it's really about self-exploration and self-realization and being open to the fact that your egocentric point of view may need to be uh, deconstructed before you see reality mm-hmm. more clearly. Huh. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast and welcome to 2021. We are excited about launching our third season of the podcast and we're starting one week later, but this was had to do with the circumstances surrounding the holidays and COVID. We are delighted that you're back with us. Our prayer is that we will all see new life rising out of the COVID tomb sometime this year, and not a return to normal, but a new turn that reveals the love of Jesus in dramatic ways for believers and skeptics alike. In fact, that's why we're doing this podcast. That's what the Wade Center celebrates, are these amazing authors who used imagination to help us think about salvation through Christ in dramatically shocking and exhilarating ways. When we did the year in review for our second season, 2020, last November, we appealed for gifts, and we are so thankful to you, our listeners in 70 different countries. You responded and sent in checks to support the Wade, which, as we explained back then, is entirely self-funded. So thank you to those of you who are giving a tangible sense of support. We also asked for suggestions about future podcasts, and we had the most votes related to our conversation today and our conversation that will end January. And the votes were for C.S. Lewis's novel, Till We Have Faces, and Dorothy Sayers' novel, Gaudy Night. Mm. And we decided to start with Till We Have Faces because it's very relevant to what we have all been going through. At the start of this novel, there is a plague that is devastating the country, Uh, just as we are still experiencing Mm. coronavirus. We also have experienced some um, problematic political activities, at least in the United States it, at the start of January. But also what is interesting about Till We Have Faces is that as a rule is starting to come to grips with her own attitudes, she identifies it as a new year. So here we start in a new year talking about Till We Have Faces. And first, let me point out before I ask David to comment on the origins of this novel is Till We Have Faces strikes me as very similar to McDonald's Fantasties. As we know, as we've talked about, Fantasties is what baptized C.S. Lewis's imagination when he was a 17-year-old atheist. So it was key to the start of his career as a Christian, getting him on that path. And Till We Have Faces is towards the end of his career. And a lot of people read both Fantasties and Till We Have Faces, and they want to like them, and they have (laughs) trouble liking them. And so that's something Mm. we're going to grapple with today. But I wonder, David, if the origins of Till We Have Faces, which I know started in C.S. Lewis's teenage years, if it was around the same time as when he read Fantasties, do scholars know? It's a few years later. He says when I was an undergraduate, which would have been more like early 20s, Mm. there's a great movement to retell myths in modern novelistic terms. So going all the way back to Frankenstein, which is called The New Prometheus. Right, right. But there are novelists. That's a century earlier. That's true. But I mean, all through the uh, 
William Morris retold a lot of these stories, including the Apulia story of the Golden Ass, which from which uh, the story of Psyche and Cupid comes. Mm. But in the 20th century, we have Robert Grays, Ursula Le Guin, Marion Zimmer, Bradley, uh, John Gardner. They're all taking ancient myths and retelling them novelistically. Most myths are just a bare outline of plot, and there's not much mm-hmm. psychology. And so people say, well, what was it like to be, you know, Iphigenia or Jason and the Argonauts? Mm. And so in many ways, he's tapping into a very contemporary trend, which is retelling myths in a modern, uh, more in-depth way. Yeah. Or why did the characters do what they did? Exactly. Because in the exactly. original Greek myths, they just kind of do things, and there's no justification. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. right. Why would you do that? Yeah. Which is why I never enjoyed reading myths when we had to read <laughs> Ulysses back in high school. Yeah. It just seemed, uh, and then this happened, then this happened, then this uh-huh. happened, then this happened. There was nothing for my intellect to grab onto. Yeah. Well, they're very plot heavy. That's true. But they tend to be archetypal plots. And the storyline stays with you for many, many years. Even Ulysses, James Joyce wrote. Oh, a modern right. novel, Ulysses, which he's taking an ordinary person from Dublin and comparing him to all the adventures uh, in the ancient tale. Well, David, I, this is just a random question, but I always wondered if maybe those stories as they're written down that we have them are just the outlines, but when they were maybe telling them in oral situations, which was mostly how mm. things were communicated back then, if they didn't just elaborate on them so that everybody knew the outline, but then when you tell the story, you can sort of elaborate on it as the poet. Does that make sense? Is that a thing that happens? Well, this is a random answer to your your random question. (laughs) My impression (laughs) is that uh, the part of the entertainment, a bard would memorize the story word for word. That's right. Oh. And when you read Ulysses, when you read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, there are these constant catchphrases like the wine dark sea, which suggest that these were written down and memorized exactly. Oh, okay. So I don't think they would elaborate. I okay. think the, the idea of wondering about the psychology of a character is kind of a modern tendency. Oh. What was it like to be mm. Agamemnon? What gotcha. was it like to be Jason's wife, Medea? Stepping into somebody else's self. Mm-hmm. Right, gotcha. right. It's probably much more like pop star songs, which don't get into deep psychology, you know, it's just... <laughs> I want you, I want you, please, you, I want you. And, um, but people memorize those songs, they mm. sing them, they um, re-inscribe them. So these ancient bards were doing that for their audiences. Huh. Yeah, basically the storytelling angle was very strong. The plot angle was very strong. I really don't think, when you read the New Testament even, you keep wondering about the psychology. How did they feel when this happened? Yeah. Uh, there's a great book, uh, by Eric Auerbach called Mimesis. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the representation of reality in Western literature. And he says that the Greeks tended to just tell the story and not ask mm-hmm. why they behave that way. Yeah, He says the Jews were the first to really, they have very little surface detail. When God appears to Abraham, you want to know, what did God look like? Where was he standing? Yeah. How did Abraham feel about being in the presence of the Lord? Yeah, But he says they're so interested in the meaning of the incident that they don't mm. dwell upon the surface details of the incident. Huh. Whereas the uh, Auerbach has a great chapter also in that book where he says the New Testament is the first book in which common people were important players in the story. Mm. Yeah. Normally mm. in Latin and Greek literature, it's kings, it's gods, it's demigods. Yeah. But suddenly fishermen and tax collectors mm. and ordinary people, their response to the situation is very important. So he feels that the dignity of the ordinary individual was greatly elevated by Christianity. Huh. Hmm. So back to Till We Have Faces, uh, Lewis had this idea clear back in his undergraduate days. He wanted to retell the tale of Cupid and Psyche from the point of view of one of the sisters. The tale is in Apuleius, the golden ass or metamorphosis, the basic idea, which Lewis summarizes in the, after the novel, he gives you a quick summary mm-hmm. of the myth that there was uh, the, the youngest daughter was so beautiful that Venus was envious of her and uh, so she had to perform four tasks in order to escape from the oppression of venus Uh he summarizes that all in the last page of the novel or after the novel but he wanted to go back and say what would it be like to be one of the other sisters he didn't like the cinderella idea that they were mean and ugly Hmm. and they mistreated her huh and so part of the reason the novel is uh challenging is this idea went back to before he was a christian 
Mm. I'm going to try to vindicate the older sister and say, from her point of view, she wasn't being envious. She wasn't being possessive. She was just trying to deal with the situation as she found it. He actually, as an undergraduate, he started a poetic version in which there is a twin brother. Twin brother to whom? Twin brother to Psyche named Jardis. And there is the nurse is named Caspian. And so he started a poetic Uh. version. I think uh, people ask where this is located. It's probably north of Greece and uh, the area of the, the Scythians. Doris Myers has a really good book on the Till We Have Faces called Bareface, which was Lewis's yeah. title for the novel. And she figured out from the fact that there are fig trees, but there are also these weather patterns. Oh, wow. There are olive trees. She said it's probably north of Greece in what is generally called the land of the Scythians. And it's probably near the Caspian Sea. Huh. So she figured out, and the time frame is after the Greeks had been very influential, but before the Romans became very influential. Interesting. The novel doesn't mention Rome or Roman right. authors. I didn't. I didn't really get. I don't get the sense when I read it that time is very important to not to the novel, though. Well, uh, it's it's not important in the sense that uh, it's they haven't heard about Christ yet. This is all happening yeah. in a barbaric mm-hmm. yeah. kingdom. Uh, where but it's have, not like we need to connect it to like real world figures or anything. Well, like except right. for the right. fact that the fox quotes from Aristotle. Yeah, he does. And he is quite clearly channeling Plato. Oh, yeah. And right. that he gets so angry at himself because he loves poetry and he <laughs> should prefer philosophy, which is exactly what people say about Plato, who yeah. wanted to ban all poets from the ideal republic and then ended up writing what many consider to be one of the most poetic parables Mm -hmm. that is still being quoted his allegory of the cave right and uh, he does there's actually uh, take me to the apple laden land is the beginning of a poem by aristotle it's the only poem that aristotle wrote oh wow and it was about the death of his wife and how she perfectly embodied virtue like psyche so you definitely could have an annotated till we have faces oh yeah because there are a lot of illusions which you pass by and you don't realize that he's actually quoting aristotle in that verse yeah uh, someone wrote to Lewis and said, is the fox supposed to be a, a, an example of anthroposophy? <laughs> <laughs> and Lewis was very gracious in his replies. He said, no, he actually represents Greek stoicism. Uh-huh. The idea, he's, he's full of ethical platitudes about being calm and rational. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would want to write back, no, you idiot. <laughs> 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 Nothing he says is like anthroposophy. No. I felt like there were like flavors of Kirkpatrick in him, though. Oh, I think so, too. Okay. I, I yeah. believe that yeah, uh, yeah, that's the fox, he's well-meaning and he's very rational. He's very calm. But I, I do believe that there's an autobiographical stream in here. Gotcha. In uh, Apuleius and in William Morris's retelling of the Cupid and Psyche myth, the father is very sympathetic. Uh, he, he can't stand the idea that he has to sacrifice his daughter to uh, the beast. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we have a very unsympathetic father here. Very much. Yeah. A violent father. Yes. Oh. So I Ugh. believe that the, the idea, the mother dies early, and so she has to, uh, a rule. We're going to say a rule. Oh, is that what we're going to say? Yeah. A rule? Uh, Doris Myers says, that looking at all the other names, she believes it should be pronounced a rule, not mm-hmm. or you all or Oriole. Oriole mm-hmm. or, uh, <laughs> Oprah. Is, that, those always, are all wrong. Always makes yeah. me want some Oreos when I read the book. Yeah, exactly. Well, I... Uh, I remember, what are you going to do when you're queen? Well, I'm going to rule. So that's how, <laughs> that's how I remember her name. But I believe that the fox has a lot of Kirkpatrick, the well-meaning uh, rationalist who doesn't realize that his philosophy isn't adequate to deal with the totality of reality. Lewis wrote a, an essay in, called Christian Apologetics in which he says there are clear religions and there are thick religions. And a clear religion has very clear ethical platitudes or Mm. ethical guidelines, Uh, such as liberal Christianity, just, you know, the golden rule. Simple answers. Simple answers. Mm -hmm. He he even puts uh, Buddhism, it's basically the Buddha started out not really as a religious figure, but more as a moral teacher. He said, if you want to reduce suffering, you have to reduce your sense of desire. The reason you suffer is because you want so much that you can't have. Uh, and so he says, those are very clear religions because it's very clear to us what you're supposed to do to make life happier, but they don't have much metaphysic. He said, there are also thick religions like Hinduism and a lot of pagan religions where there's ritual, there's sacrament, there's sacrifice. Yeah. And he says, a, a full-bodied religion needs to be both clear and thick. Oh. So what we're seeing until we have faces 
is the fox is a very clear moral teacher, but he has no metaphysic. Uh, uh, whereas the uh, priest of Ungat, there's a lot of uh, blood sacrifice yeah. and mystery, but they don't have a very clear sense of what exactly it is they're doing. And it tends to be mm-hmm. a religion of fear. Yeah, The priest mm-hmm. says, the, the old priest is, is old school in terms of performing all the duties of his religion without understanding them. The younger priest has definitely been influenced by the fox, and he's sort of a modernizer. Oh, he says, well, Ungut yeah. the goddess actually represents the fertility of the earth. <laughs> and so he's a good guy, but he's trying to take all the mystery out of religion. Yeah. So Lewis is kind of satirizing that approach. He says that true religion must be both clear and thick. It can't be one or the other. He feels like he's kind of satirizing some of the sort of modern Anglican figures who are right, doing that right. in England at mm-hmm. that time of, right. you know, mm-hmm. like, well, when in the Bible talks about this, it actually means this kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Yeah. Honest to God was written by... Robinson? Yeah, Robinson. And he was the Bishop of Woolwich. Yeah. But Lewis called him the Bishop of Woolworths. <laughs> He, th- he thought that was a very uh, pretty thin gruel for yeah. a religious figure. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. John Robinson. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is that it is both and. Uh oh, there which, you go. Oh, yeah. I know my <laughs> favorite right. paradigm: the incarnational view of truth, and you see that throughout this text because at one point. A rule will say of herself or someone says of her, you are psyche. And then at another point, they say, well, you are unget. Well, she is both. Right. And that's why Mm. it's it's not the simplistic, oh, she was a benighted, selfish person. And then suddenly she has this revelation and she um, learns about sacrificial love. No, she's like us all. We are all have that um, self-centeredness, that thorn in the flesh, Mm -hmm. but we all have, those of us who are Christians, we have Christ who is like psyche, who is modeling for us what sacrificial love would be like. Which is what we see at the end of the novel. Part of the reason people struggle with it, it's the only novel he wrote in which characters are very complex. Generally, people like Lewis's fiction. Yeah. Because these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. The good guys are humanist. They are, I mean, they're uh, in the humanities. They love literature and the classics. They tend to be Christians. In this novel, everybody's more psychologically layered or complex. The fox mm, is a good yeah. person, but he ultimately dismisses philosophy and religion as the lie of po- lies of poets. Yeah, and they change over the course of the novel. Right, so that right. as they're looking back, they're criticizing their former selves. So whoever you maybe decided to side with at the beginning of the novel, mm-hmm. you now find yourself not being able to sympathize with the right. former version of them, which right. is probably closer to reality because most mm-hmm. of us, when we look back at ourselves in the past, we think, Golly, I was so naive to think this, that, mm-hmm. or right. you know, whatever. Well, right. even when a rule in that last section, um, and she talks about, okay, in the process of writing down my story, I'm starting to understand myself. Mm. And one of the things that she even starts reevaluating is her total dismissal of her sister Redival mm. and starts understanding, well, yeah, Redival was this airbrain individual just looking for attention mm. and love, but she starts realizing, oh, maybe it's because of this. Yeah. And she does the same thing with Barda's wife. Bardia. Bardia. Bardia's wife, which, of course, just like Redival, she dismisses as not even worth the time of day. She thinks the same thing about Bardia's wife. Yeah. And then discovers that she and Bardia's wife have something in common as well. And that moment where they hug each other. Yeah. And so it's not just a rule discovering she has both psyche and unget, but she's discovering the both and of other people that even we as readers were kind of seeing through her eyes and thinking, oh yeah, her sister Redival is yeah. just right. um, so empty headed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the reason the novel confuses people. The, the usual charge is obscurity. When it came out, it was Lewis's favorite novel, Yeah, but the reviewers were the least favorable of anything he got. He said that really? he'd never had a book that was so unfavorably reviewed. Oh, wow. In a strange way, he didn't like literary modernism, but this novel is somewhat Christian modernism. Right. It starts out feeling allegorical. 
uh, with Psyche seems to be a Christ figure who has to give her life for the sake of everyone else. And then the middle section is very realistic historical novel, uh -huh. uh, fighting the ruler of the other country and just trying to get Gloam back into shape financially and mm -hmm. economically. And then the end is very mystical when he sees she sees Psyche yeah. and she becomes Psyche. So it has a, uh, I wouldn't say uneven tone, but it shifts its emphasis. And a lot of readers are uncomfortable with that. As I say, though, that's a characteristic of modernist novels. If you read The Portrait of the Artist, one is very clearly about childhood. One is very clearly about loss of faith. One chapter is very clearly about discovering his vocation as an artist. Uh, and you have to be prepared to have these major shifts in tone. Yeah, it's like three different stories in one almost. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone wrote to Lewis and said, is, is Psyche meant to be a Christ figure? And, and he said, well, n not any more than any good person is a Christ figure. Good people sacrifice themselves for the good of others. But he didn't want it to be read allegorically. Although he has so many biblical allusions yeah, to describe psyche, that, yeah, right. that's what I struggled with in the first in the first first part. Is it, it feels very much like it wants to be an allegory, yeah, right, right. yeah. But he spends so much time on the sort of motivation of the characters right. that it felt like he's more interested in sort of solving that problem. And so I, I I really struggle to get through the first half because I'm not really sure how to interpret it it's sort of like there's multiple things going on at right, the same time right. and it's trying to be too many things the the last part i think works really well to wrap everything up but i have always struggled with the first part mm. well yeah i agree and i think he did and part of this is he started thinking about the storyline before he was a christian mm. so his first impulse was i'm going to vindicate this older sister from her point of view she wasn't being possessive she wasn't being yeah. envious but when he wrote it as a christian uh, this is when Joy Davidman was a part of Lewis's life, and he said he was having a dry spell creatively, mm -hmm. and he didn't know what to write next. And she said, well, you've always loved historical novels. You've always wanted to do a Covatus or a Ben-Hur, uh -huh. and you have such knowledge of the classical world. Maybe you should try to write a novel set in the classical world. And after that conversation, the, like, almost the next day, he showed up with a complete chapter written. Now, which, going back to this. which chapter did he start with? That would be interesting. I, I was curious about that. Does he start with the middle section or the first part? Or? I think he started with the, the idea that this is my complaint against the gods. Uh, everybody has blamed me for being this evil sister. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, I was really trying to do the right thing all along. Yeah. So I believe his beginning was the beginning of the novel. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think and, his Christianity comes out very explicitly at the end. There's a movie called mm -hmm. The Upside of Anger. Mm. where this mother, her husband just disappears and she assumes he took off with this cute secretary from the office. And uh, the whole novel, she's saying to her daughters, don't trust men. Men are so bad. Men are unreliable. Mm -hmm. you know. And then at the end of the movie, we discover that the guy fell into an old well and died. <laughs> uh, and it's fascinating. The entire movie, you're assuming this guy's a jerk. And at the end, you find out, oh, no. Yeah. He because it's all from the... From her her point of right. view yeah. of and, feeling injured. Right. I'm sorry about the spoiler alert there for you who hey. to rent uh, Upside hey. of Anger. Good film is not about plot. It's about the construction. Right. So. Ooh. But I, I brought that up because at the end, Lewis was getting ready to write The Four Loves in 1960. He'd just written Surprised by Joy, which called for a lot of internal uh, investigation. What was my childhood about? I lost my mother. I was alienated from my father. Slowly, I grew to this realization of, of uh, what it was I was longing for all my life. Yeah. The very next year, he writes, Till We Have Faces. Huh. And then in uh, 1960, he writes The Four Loves. And one of the main themes of The Four Loves is that any love which um, is not angelic tends to be demonic. It tends to become possessive. This mm -hmm. is about me and my needs. Even the uh, epigraph is something like, uh, the epigraph of Till We Have Faces, a myth retold. So he's thinking about the old myth from Apuleius. Love is too young to know what conscience is. And so uh, mm. Arul doesn't realize it, but her love for Psyche is not a pure love. It's a possessive love. Mm. Lewis said in a letter that it's somewhat like a situation where someone who's close to you gets religion. And suddenly their faith becomes very important to them. And you're, you're left out. You say, well, why are you getting so excited about this faith in this worldview, which I don't share? Mm -hmm. I believe there's an allusion there to Mrs. Moore. 
She used to make fun of the Lewis brothers for going to church and said, oh, you're going to go to that cannibalistic ritual where you drink blood and eat flesh. So uh, somebody should write an art. We talk about articles and books that need to be written. Uh huh. And somebody should write about material, emotional and psychological material that Lewis got from Mrs. Moore. Ooh. I believe the idea of, I, I think I love Psyche and she's so wonderful and she's the center of my, my being, but there's a resentment when Psyche suddenly has a whole other life. Yeah. She's married to this God. She goes, and so that's another thing to account for is the reason it's called Till We Have Faces is because there's this major journey of self-realization. And originally he wanted to call it bareface, meaning, you know, let's, let's, expose ourselves who we really are Our rather selves. than yeah yeah the uh the publisher said well people will think that sounds like a western novel <laughs> like pale face oh uh, no so, yeah <laughs> well so you know what you sh- should have called it shoot out at the O'Rule uh corral <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> oh man um what were you were you were just talking about people who resent when somebody leaves the family to embrace christian faith and i ran into that when i was in grad school i like many graduate students i was teaching um intro to composition course and i encountered this one student who just every single paper he wrote he just attacked christianity in just vicious unwarranted ways and Mm. so i sat down with him and said you know you have a lot a lot of anger here and it turns out his Jewish parents were so upset when he, after attending Young Life for a year, he became a Christian and they hired a deprogrammer. And so when I was reading the part in the section where they're trying to convince Psyche that, no, this is a monster you married and this is an illusion you have, it reminded me of this deprogramming. And of course, Um, after it was real big in the 80s, but then some um, people started protesting the tactics of deprogrammers. Uh, Yeah. Uh, But it's that same type of thing. A family feels the loss of their child if they convert to a different religion. Mm. Like a rule feels the loss of psyche. Yeah. So you took the student aside and said, I've been reading your papers and I'm worried that you're going to hell. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> was, was that the theme of your, conf- no, of your conference? No, no, but it just made me so sad because basically yeah. deprogramming was a type of almost like hypnosis That's, and it worked really well. It's he, programming. Yeah. Yeah, it is yeah. programming. It's not right. yeah. deprogramming. Right. It's, it's just programming in a programming. different yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I like I like or- Oriole's, uh, the, or, how are we saying it? We're going to say O'Rule. O'Rule. Sorry. We, I like O'Rule's realization that she has towards the end about Bardia where she realizes right. that um, she, as he says in the novel, uh, she loved Bardia, but not Bardia himself. Mm-hmm. And she says, um, mm. her, she describes her love, Lewis describes her love, he says, to whom I could give nothing, of whom I craved all. So there's definitely that possessive element. But like you were saying, my struggle with is the way that people sort of resolve that love problem of this possessive love and turn it into a totally depossessive or a purely mm. unselfish love. Right. And um, I feel like that's that sort of idea of agape where you're just sacrificing and you're expecting absolutely nothing in return um, is not what Lewis is trying to portray in the novel. And one place where I think you can see that is when the fox describes, uh, he says, we are all limbs and parts of one another. And I think mm. Lewis is trying to invoke sort of the body of Christ and this idea of bearing one another's mm. burdens. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to paint this picture that uh, true love is not necessarily just giving up everything and wandering alone in the wilderness and just suffering for suffering's sake, but is being willing to give to other people so that they can flourish, but then also being willing to receive. And I think you see that mm. when... Mm-hmm. Or, or it's rural. both and. It is. Right. When Orul <laughs> uh, veils her face... It's not just that she's trying to um, prevent other people from seeing her, but when she does that, she ceases to see other people as they truly are. Mm -hmm. So she does that to Bardia's wife, and Mm -hmm. she does that to all these figures in sort of the middle part of the book, and then she has the realization towards the end when Bardia dies that like, oh, wow, I was 
keeping him around because I didn't want to be lonely. Right. Mm, um, right. And I used him up in order to avoid having to suffer myself. Mm-hmm. And then sort of the realization at the end of the book is that she's been, she took the suffering of psyche and psyche accomplished the tasks. And so they sort of exchanged. It's kind of William's idea of mm-hmm. coherence. Mm-hmm. And so rather than just, uh, naked altruism. It's more of a bearing of one another's burdens. Right. And I feel right. like a lot of people, at least when they've talked about the four loves or even this book, that's always been the message that they get out of it is this sort of like pure unselfishness. Mm-hmm. And I came across a quote from Lewis in The Weight of Glory and I wanted to read it real quickly. He says, if you ask 20 good men today what they thought the highest of the virtues, mm-hmm. 19 of them would reply unselfishness. But if you asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied, love. Mm -hmm. You see what has happened. A negative term has been substituted for a positive. And then he says, the negative idea of unselfishness carries with Mm -hmm. it the suggestion of not primarily of securing good things for others, but of going without them ourselves, as if abstinence and not their happiness was the important point. I do not think this is the Christian virtue of love. The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. And so he goes mm-hmm. on to say that the sort of purpose of love and and we're created with this desire to have other people in our lives. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because God wants to give to us through others. So he talks about being uh, Christianity and in and not through or in and through. So this idea of bearing one another's burden and being part of the body of Christ is that in enjoying someone else or enjoying something that God's created, we're enjoying God. And that's part of mm-hmm. what this idea of love is. And so mm-hmm. I I, th- I see that in the novel where she sort of recognizes what other people have gone through for her right. and, and repents, um, but then also understands that in her own way, she's been going through things and bearing burdens for other people. And that's sort of part of her uh, conversion towards the end of the story. Right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. The idea that you are ungut, but you are also psyche. It reminds me of uh, Ransom in the in Paralandra that he's piebald. Part of him mm-hmm. is still the mm-hmm. old Adam yeah. that's mm-hmm. angry about this mission and being in over his head, and he doesn't know what to do. But part of him is the new Adam, the Christ nature that more and more he's learning to assimilate on his adventures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think in some ways ungut represents the the old Adam, the fallen self. Uh, he actually gave description to the cover of the novel. And he wanted this, uh, once again, the thick versus the clear. He wanted this ugly, Mm. uh, unshapen, misshapen, ungut figure. But then he also wanted this beautiful female Aphrodite figure. But somehow you're supposed to feel that the Aphrodite figure is too much like a doll and the ungut figure has more power in it than the the statuette of Aphrodite. Uh Um, I think another big theme is uh, Lewis does this in Last Battle. People say seeing is believing, but Lewis got from McDonald the idea that believing is seeing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the princess and, and Curdie, uh, Curdie can't see the grandmother Irene and her, her beauty and her spinning wheel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He just sees an empty attic. And Lewis picked that up in Last Battle where the dwarves, when they go inside the stable, all they see is straw and... and uh, the kind of things you would ordinarily find. They don't see the new Narnia. Yeah. Or even Lucy who can see Aslan when her siblings can't because she believes in him. She doesn't believe anymore. Yeah. Yeah, She's spiritually attuned to be able to see him. So Psyche immediately recognizes that Cupid is a God and there is a palace and uh, a rule really struggles against that. She doesn't see the palace. She has a glimpse of the palace but it was so brief that she doesn't believe it. And she goes, when she talks to the fox, yeah. she doesn't bring up the fact that she herself saw the right. palace. Yeah, she doesn't even want to admit it to herself almost. as You know, it was a, an illusion mm-hmm. or she was deceived or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that, I, I like that part of the book, but, um, but I think that part of the struggle, well, maybe this is the strength of the book, is that he's, it's from Aurel's perspective. And so you're kind of like, well, is Psyche crazy? Is she crazy? Right. You don't really know who to believe. And he's kind of putting mm-hmm. you, I guess, in that same situation as right. the reader, you know. Right. And I think that's where Lewis was through many of his 20s. He had these intuitions of a spiritual realm, but he really couldn't pin them down. Right. I and he it, almost wanted to resist them the way Aurel resisted that one glimpse she had of the palace. Mm. That's why I think it's so fascinating that he started conceptualizing this 
narrative because he was originally going to make it a, a poem. But while he was an atheist and then actually created it while he was a Christian, because in a way, that's another both and component because Lewis is exposing what he also believed as an atheist, that most religions are operating in a quid pro quo form where it's all about um, rites and rituals and practices to mm. please the gods. Yeah, yeah, you get what right. you deserve. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that is the, the realm of unget. And so that also has to do with Aaron's good point about it not just being this simplistic culmination with, oh, she learns that the important thing is unselfish love, because even that could be quid pro quo, mm -hmm. this for that. Oh, as long as I'm unselfish, yep. the gods will love me. Yeah. But love, which is modeled for us, and the, the profundity of Christian doctrine that God is a trinity, which means mm. when we're told God is love, well, love means the other. Yeah, communion. So God, mm -hmm. yes, God's very nature is communion with the other. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in constant communion with each other. Yeah. And then God welcomes us to be part of that communion yeah. rather than just this self-sacrifice which gets you God's approval. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think another theme is in some ways we choose to believe and we even choose our emotional responses. There's a beautiful scene where you're going back up to the Gray Mountain to try to find what happened to Psyche. This is Bardia and, mm. and Arul. And there's the beauty of nature. She's with Bardia and she her, her heart says, why should my heart not dance? This is so beautiful. This is so wonderful. Why shouldn't I enjoy this moment? Yeah. And she fights it off. She says, no. I'm bitter. My sister is gone. Yeah. And so she refuses mm. to accept these feelings of beauty and joy. It reminds me of a, a character in Great Divorce. There's the dwarf that has the mannequin figure. And uh, the woman he's talking to, Sarah Smith of Golders Green, says, don't you see that there's all this joy available to you? You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be. And he says, the struggle of that dwarf against joy was amazing to behold. That <sighs> Joy was being offered to him, but he didn't want it. He wanted to hold on to his bitterness. And there's some of that in Orul, that mm. she has opportunities to really uh, recover emotionally and to sense the basic wonder of life and beauty of life, but she fights against it. She likes her bitterness more than she likes mm. uh, even a feeling of joy or yeah. regaling herself in her environment. Yeah, and since part of what drew C.S. Lewis to faith was his own sense of longing, of beauty, of the sense that there's this other world. And he gives that to Psyche mm -hmm. so that she says, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to reach the mountain, to find the place mm -hmm. where all the beauty came from. My country, the place where I ought to have been born. Right. That's very much an expression of sinsucht. Once again, in the last battle, he says, this is the country I've dreamed of all my life when they get to the new mm -hmm. Narnia. Mm. It, is, it, it, it is confusing because in a way she seems like a Christ figure, but in another way, she is a normal human being who's trying to connect with the beauty that's so elusive and she's trying to discover that. She's actually very resigned to going to the great mountain because this is her chance to be united with that beauty. Mm. Well, and then she exemplifies that love that Aaron was talking about insofar as the reason Psyche goes out into the the town is she cares for the people right. and she will touch people who have the plague and they get better. But that's also another parallel with Christ is that all these people who are adulating her when things go bad again, then they blame her. Yeah. And then she has to be sacrificed. See, right. I think that's, I think, you know, people would focus on the sort of the part where they sacrifice Psyche and she's kind of a Christ figure mm -hmm. kind of a thing. But I don't think that Lewis is setting that up in the novel as like, oh, well, that's what made the plague go away. 
was the sacrifice of her. Right. Because that's the the sort of wrong view of religion. That's which quid is, pro quo. Exactly, which right. is, okay, we will give the gods this, and then the gods will be obligated to, you know, right. heal this, uh, heal us. I think actually the picture that Lewis is trying to portray is more of Psyche going out and taking on their burdens willingly mm-hmm. because she cares for them and she loves them um, as opposed to sort of, like you said, this sort of like, we'll sacrifice and then we'll give you this mm-hmm. and then you give us this and then we'll be good. Um, and so it's that taking on someone else's burdens because you care for them. I think that Lewis is trying to set up as the example throughout the novel. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I also like his uh, line. I think it's the Fox says it towards the end when they're sort of, she's going to be tried before the gods. And um, she asks about whether, you know, she's going to get justice. And the Fox says, no, the gods aren't just. But what he means is, they don't give us what we deserve because if they did, then we, oh, all right. we would, we would right. all, we would all be punished. We would all, right. you know, we'd all go to the underworld or, or you know, wherever they do in this sort of pre-Christian world. But that's a, I think that's a big theme that you see throughout Lewis's novels is this idea that um, we actually don't want God to give us what we deserve. You know, we want justice when we feel like mm. we've been wronged. Right. But we really don't want justice. We we want justice for other people, <laughs> but we don't want it right. for ourselves because if we did, then we would be punished and we all deserve to be mm-hmm. punished. And so there's that element in the novel of uh, incongruent love, incongruent grace that God God gives us grace that we don't deserve. Right. Um, and the we gift. Should, we should be grateful right. for that um, as opposed to thinking that there are certain things that we have to do in order to be worthy of, to receive God's grace or his forgiveness. It's a question of, you know, God chooses to give that to us regardless of our worth because none of us are worthy to receive it. So right. I think that's a good theme throughout the novel, but it it's really strong towards the end. Right. Mm-hmm. Lewis made that point in re- Reflections on the Psalms. He says in the Old Testament, God is the judge, but the speaker is usually the plaintiff. I've been wronged, God. Why aren't you going to do something about this? My enemies are overwhelming me. Yeah. He says in the New Testament, the point of view is not the plaintiff, but the person being accused. We're the ones who are guilty. We're the ones who have failed. Yeah. And he says it's a very different emphasis to think about your relationship to God as the person who's been accused as opposed to the accuser. Yeah. I think Lewis does that in, in Till We Have Faces. You know, it starts off where she's making the right. accusations, and then at the end she realizes that, you know, she's the accused. Mm. She sees herself uh, trying to prevent psyche from completing this journey right. to go get the box and she who is this horrible woman and she's being mean to her and then she realizes oh it's herself it's, right. it's maya the complaint my complaint was my answer she says it one yeah mm. and it's it's very much uh it's interesting because it, it's like the it's like job meets the new testament at the uh-huh. same time um, uh-huh. and so mm. it's a very um yeah it's a very deep novel i think it right. kind of defies mm-hmm. simple explanations yeah so, and the first couple times I read it, I did not like it. Yeah, me too. It is one of those novels that you have to contemplate it in order to enjoy it. Mm. I think people would enjoy it more if they didn't know it was by C.S. Lewis. No. I was at a conference yeah. once because people have expectations. This is yeah. going to be good versus evil. It's going to be clear. We're not going to have this moral and psychological complexity. An apologetic stance. Right. Mm-hmm. I was well, at a uh, conference once where the... A fellow said that he was doing a book club until we have faces, and it just said C.S. Lewis, and there was no biographical information on the novel. And someone started saying she, the writer, he just decided to go with it. For so the whole discussion, they said she portrays a rule as this, and she understands uh, what it's like to be the daughter of a dominant father. And finally, at the end of the discussion, he said, "Well, actually, the C stands for Clive. This was written by a male." And they were all shocked. They were sure it was written by a woman because oh, the wow. entire novel from the point of view of a woman. So I think people would enjoy it more if they looked at it with fresh eyes and didn't say, oh, this has got to be a continuation of Narnia or a continuation mm-hmm. of the yeah. Ransom Trilogy. Well, that was one of my challenges that I've read when I read the book. I think it's very much oriented towards a Western audience that has become right. disenchanted with the world where right. it doesn't see God in things. It's very much mm-hmm. the perspective of or. Oriole and uh, the fox at the beginning of the novel, right. mm-hmm. you know, where they're sort of explaining away everything and rationalizing everything, very much logic and very um, naturalistic explanation right. of the world. Right. 
But I think the thing that I, I've struggled with it over the years is a lot of Lewis's novels are so useful as an apologetic for people around right. the world. And I've heard people say, well, it's got this universal application because it's in a pre-Christian world. But I feel like in a lot of other countries, they are still struggling against polytheism, like in, in India. I know we right. have a number of listeners in India. And I think that's one of the challenging things about the novel is because it takes place in this sort of polytheistic context. And Lewis is affirming the gods and their existence, but he's not really clarifying that there's only one God. Um, mm, and so I, I think that's a challenging aspect to the novel, which kind of complicates it in terms of mm, its message. Mm-hmm. Is it, it, I think it would resonate with somebody who's coming at it from a post-Christian perspective, but maybe not somebody who's coming at it from a sort of pre-Christian polytheistic perspective. Right. I think a Greek an ancient Greek could read this story and walk away from it and think it's a great telling of the novel, but in no way, shape, or form be, you know, converted, so to speak. Right, right. Right. And interesting, this goes back to the origins in Lewis's own atheism and then a type of collaboration between him and uh, Joy Davidman because Mm. they would talk it out and then he'd write something up and then she'd read it and Mm -hmm. talk it out. And of course, she started life as an atheist as Uh, well. And so they were able to capture the convincingness of their resistance to religion, but then the sense that, no, there is something more profound. There is that final vision on the mountain is just that we don't always see it. Yeah. Well, that's a whole new topic is uh, how did Joy Davidman fit into the novel? Um, They had this conversation before Lewis started writing about what he should do in a historical novel. Uh, She typed it for him. We have the typewriter that she typed it on. At the Wade Center. At the Wade Center. You can put your fingers on the keys and see if suddenly this creative No, you can't. It's under (laughs) glass. Yeah. (laughs) And you'd be tased by a guard before you got close to it. Although I helped Doug Gresham put it back in its little container because it's in one of those typewriters that you can put in like a little clamshell and carry. And I remember when we were trying to put the top back on it, I was like, don't break this, don't break this. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Uh, Well, she said, um, she was an editor. She said, he's uh, 10 times better writer than I am. But as an editor, I help him write more like himself. Yeah, which is the sign of a good editor. Mm. Right. But Doug wonders, there was domestic violence in their home. We have a violent father. Uh, Joy had an experience long before she became a Christian where she saw a bush that had been covered with ice crystals and the sun hit it and it looked like the burning bush. And she had this feeling of an an epiphany. Is this an appearance of God, this burning Mm. bush? Huh. Um, But later she said, oh no, it's just the sunlight hitting this bush which was covered in ice crystals. But it's a little bit like looking at the castle and saying, no, there's nothing there. What, what, was there something there? Uh. So an interesting topic would be how much of Joy's life experiences got into this novel. She also... Um, Abigail somewhat, Santa Maria, in her biography of right. Joy, has several pages dedicated to that. Mm. And what does she say? She, um, well... She quotes George Sayer, the biographer of C.S. Lewis. He thinks that Joy could legitimately be considered a co-author. I think that is Mm. hyperbole. And I think Joy herself would uh, repudiate that idea because she was enough of a writer herself to know that just by having conversations with someone and editing them, that is not co-authorship. But she also had tried her hand at rewriting a a Greek myth. Of course, this was the thing to do, as David mm-hmm. mentioned, uh-huh. um, this modernist rewriting of the, the classics. And, you know, even going back since the Enlightenment in the 18th century and this, this dismissal of Christianity, a lot of interest was going back. I mean— the Enlightenment was called the neoclassical era. It's about yeah. getting back to the Greek vision. Yeah. You know, Plato and Aristotle, we don't need all these superstitions of right. Christianity. Yeah. Right. So it makes sense that modernists were fascinated by Greek and Roman myths, but then Joy and Lewis and their conversation helped transform them. Mm. Right, right. He has an unfinished piece about Helen of Troy. He really liked the idea of 
looking at mythology and re-mythologizing or telling the story from he, a modern He being Lewis? Of, he being Lewis, right. Oh, wow. Another source I wanted to mention, uh, after the title Bareface was rejected, he had to think about, well, what are we going to call it? And finally, they came up with Till We Have Faces. I believe that title may come from a famous passage in Augustine. Uh, in Till We Have Faces, Lewis writes, this is a rule. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Why should they hear the beep babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? There's the title. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, Lewis loved uh, Augustine's Confessions. And in the Confessions, Augustine says, And where was I when I was seeking you? You were there in front of me, but I had gone away, even from myself. I could not find myself, much less find you. And I wonder if that passage influenced Till We Have Faces, because huh. it's really about self-realization and the gradual falling of the scales from the eyes to see yeah. what's really going on, as opposed to an egocentric view. So I, you know what I find fascinating when I read back through this again, David, is right before that in the book, uh, the line, Till We Have Faces, I guess it's the fox is talking, and he he gives this advice that sounds a lot like the advice that Lewis gave for writing, and so it's like Lewis mm. works in his own advice about being an, right. a good author into the sort of core message of the book where he's right. saying, you know, say what you mean and be direct. And, and until we can learn what we have to truly say, then why would the gods want to listen to us? Right. And that, right. that fascinated me. I had never connected those two things. So that was an interesting thing to yeah, see. Yeah, there's definitely an autobiographical a thread going through the story. He says in the story, I was with book, meaning yeah. she needed to write, like being with child. Yeah. He said the exact same thing in a letter. So this is Lewis himself thinking that you're almost pregnant with a, a book project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's definitely a, a thread of Lewis himself throughout the entire it's novel. It's like Lewis, the literary critic, shifts into the sort of message of the book. I thought it right, was very uh, right. interesting. Mm. Uh, there's also an allusion to the Pearl. There's a famous medieval poem by the Pearl poet who's lost mm. his daughter, and he sees her in a vision across the river. And mm. when O'Rule sees Psyche, uh, on the other side of a river. There's oh. very much this sense of the pearl poet that someone that, dear to you that you've lost, you may have an, an opportunity to huh. meet with that person again in different circumstances. So I have another question, David. In the book, uh, in the original myth, uh, the goddess uh, that, you know, is in, instead of Ungit, it's Venus. Am right. I correct there? Right, mm -hmm. But Venus in Greek mythology is pretty attractive, Am I, am I correct there? I mean, as far as I can remember. And then, so why does Lewis make that shift? And Ungit is like the most awful sounding name. Mm -hmm. uh, you go from Venus to Ungit. It seems like yeah. a very intentional decision on Lewis's part. Is that because of Oruel's ugliness and she's also Ungit? Or w why did Lewis make that decision? Where did that name come from? Well, the, the fox himself explains that there's the Greek Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love. But then there is the... Ephesian goddess of love, which is much more like a pagan goddess of fertility. Mm -hmm. So he, this is why I wanted these two different figures on the cover of the novel. There's sort wow. of the idealized Venus goddess of love versus sometimes when you see these early um, fertility symbols from pagan cultures, there'll be a, a clay figure with exaggerated breast and exaggerated yeah. Uh, genitalia. Yeah. And they're not at all beautiful, but they're really about fertility. Oh. So I think he's playing on the Greek view of the goddess of love versus the pagan view that you find in, I think uh, this gets mentioned in the New Testament. They talk about the uh, Aphrodite of the Ephesians. Don't they talk about that somewhere in one, in the book of Acts? I Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Which is much more of a f fertility goddess for everything. The crops, the animals, humans, oh as opposed to this idealized goddess of love. I guess I had just never thought of that figure in any sort of mythology as being ugly. So I, thought, I just thought it was a very interesting, intentional choice by Lewis to emphasize that. Right. And to right. pick a name that is, even Aphrodite doesn't sound like a, to our ears, doesn't sound like a ugly name, you know? So, yeah. But Ungit is like... Ungit, yeah. <laughs> like, ugh. It's, it sounds like ugly. what she looks like. Yeah. Ugly. Yeah. Ugly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting that Lewis himself, in his very first conception, he wanted this sister to be ugly. Clear back in the 20s, he said, I'm going to retell the story from the point of view of one of the sisters who's vindicating her behavior. But even then, he thought of her as an ugly huh. human being. Huh. And I'm not quite sure why that was so essential to the story in his mind, but that was 
one of the fundamental elements that he wanted to build into the story from the very beginning. Huh. That reminds me of one of the lovely moments that people probably don't remember in the novel when Bardia is really sick and a rule had meets Bardia's wife oh, and yeah. Bardia's wife said, you had Bardia more than I did. Mm. And Arul is just outraged. You're jealous of me? And she takes off her veil. Yeah. And the wife, Bardia's wife, doesn't say, she in the text, she says, I didn't realize, or something like that. And you think she's going to say, oh, I didn't realize you were so ugly. Of course I can't be jealous of you. But instead, Arul takes off her veil. The wife says, I didn't realize you loved him too. And she doesn't see a rule's ugliness. She sees a rule's self. Yeah. Mm. It's a powerful, mm. powerful moment. And it's just this minor character that yeah. has only been talked about because she's a source of jealousy on a yeah. rule's part. Because she basically is in love with Bardia. Yeah. Bardia is the only male who's ever given her much attention, not in any erotic way, but yeah. because he respects her yeah. and mm. supports her. So I think that is key to what's happening here is that ugliness of the soul is oh. far worse than ugliness of the person. Mm. So Lewis makes Ungit, yes, on the surface, Ungit is just kind of this formless, almost a phallic image covered with blood, um, but also reflects the, the ugliest view of religion, where you have yeah. to appease the gods yeah. and the gods get all the best food. You sacrifice your young daughters to the gods yeah, and the best land. And yeah, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Right. yeah. Right. 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 Well, and then at the end when, when Oral gets, uh, you know, gets beauty and, and, and she gets it from psyche, her soul, her, her, her inner self has also become beautiful yes. as well. And so that's, and a, that's what's important. A rewarding right. ending for the book as opposed to her just getting beauty and, but she's still, right. nothing changes right. about her on the right. inside. Right, right. And so contrary to our own culture that uh, where surfaces are what defines a person. Yeah. How much money you have, glamour you have, beauty you have, hence the plastic surgery surgery industry is yeah. um, right. incredibly vibrant. Yeah, definitely. So uh, as we look into 2021 and uh, wrap up a very difficult 2020 that feels like it still hasn't ended yet, right? <sighs> what, what takeaways would uh, you guys say that we should look for from this novel? Maybe what should people think about as they go? Maybe some pe this may spur people to pick up their copy until we have faces back up and read it again. What, what do you think people should or look for when they're reading till we have faces? Their takeaway, they should listen to this podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chesterton said that pride is a inability to see the universe as it is due to the intrusion of the ego. Mm. And my takeaway would be that this is a very in-depth study of a person who's trying to be a good person, yeah, yeah. but she doesn't have self-awareness. And she thinks that uh, she's been mistreated by the gods. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Psyche? She doesn't realize her love for Psyche is very possessive. She doesn't realize her love for Barty is possessive. She doesn't realize the reason that Redival became kind of a bad girl is because she felt left out. Right. So I think it's really about self-exploration and self-realization and being open to the fact that your egocentric point of view may need to be uh, deconstructed before you see reality mm -hmm. more clearly. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I would tell people then, and this is what really helped me this time, my third time through, is try to identify with a rule. Oh, you know, right. How do I have that ugliness inside of me? Mm. And the part that I identified with the most is a rule when she becomes a ruler. Yeah. She is conscientious. She works hard. Mm -hmm. She represents her whole kingdom in that um, sword fight. Mm -hmm. She risks her life and she works hard, works hard, works hard. But the trouble is, and this is one of my great failings too, is even my work, I res 
reduced to quid pro quo. It's kind of like, well, why aren't people recognizing how hard I work? Uh. And so once I began to see that ugliness within my own self, I could better sympathize with a rule because it's hard to sympathize with her, yeah. especially early on when she's just getting mad at Psyche. She she says, well, I would rather kill Psyche myself than let her go to the shadow beast. Yeah. And I, yeah, I kind of go, I, I don't consider uh-huh. that love. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I, I was watching a video the other day, uh, don't ask me why, on YouTube about narcissists and how it's driven by this desire to uh, project a false self because they're terrified mm. of of their true oh. self. Mm. They're trying to so they try to um, boast and and project this sort of perfect idealized mm. self to others because they're sort of afraid of any sort of self analysis. They're so, sort of their inner self is very um, broken and shattered and mm-hmm. ugly. Mm-hmm. And um, and that that to me was coming out in the character of Oral through the novel is I don't know that you would describe her as narcissistic or prideful, but that's definitely how she's approaching the world is she very much sort of projects onto other people mm-hmm. and uh, is afraid of being uh, mm-hmm. vulnerable. And I think it's that own sort of fear of that ugliness within her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, because her father, I mean, he starting the novel, that also makes it feel just a little too simplistic because the father is just so awful. He's racist. Yeah. He's sexist. Yeah. He's violent. He just kills people who trip. Um, but then what is fascinating, because a, a rule is disgusted with her father as is everybody else. But then you start seeing glimmers of how she is like her father, just in these subtle ways. And I think that's another psychological insight um, that things that often most disgust us in other people, maybe the reason it disgusts us is that there's a little bit of that in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Lou said that about pride. He said the, the way that you can tell how prideful you are is how much prideful behavior on other people's part really bothers you. Mm. Is someone's yeah. boasting? Some people go, "Oh, well, they're you know." And others, somebody else goes, "Why are you boasting? You're not that important." So, uh, yeah, I think uh, part of our takeaway from this novel is you can go around to people and say, "You think you're psyche, but you're unget." <laughs> <laughs> No, you're both and. Oh, both and. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you guys for uh, talking about this novel. It was good for me to read it again. I'd read it twice before, um, but this time it uh, I had a better appreciation for it, which I always find when we go and do these discussions. So that was good. So uh, next episode, we're going to talk about Gaudy, Gaudy Night. Night. Gaudy Night. Very so uh, I guess if you're out there and you're listening and you have a copy of Gaudy Night or you want to get one, you could read it. And then when we talk about it next week, um, hopefully we'll have some interesting discussion about it. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about The Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.